Yes. Um, so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our audience, uh, wherever you're joining from. We are delighted to have you uh, for the Science Day lecture at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. I'm G. Ravindra Kumar, the Secretary of the TIFR Alumni Association. And it's a great pleasure for me and my colleagues uh, to invite you to enjoy this lecture. This event is very important on the calendar of the Institute. Um, you know, it's a Science Day is a celebrated thing across the country. Um, in We recall the great achievements of the scientists of the past. And uh, today we are particularly delighted to have a great lecturer with us who will tell us about some very interesting things in a short while. But before that, um, while welcoming him, I also uh, invite our director, uh, our uh, president, uh, Professor Dipan Ghosh, to say a few words. Uh, good evening, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor uh, Sur. Um, we traditionally celebrate this day in India as National Science Day uh, in uh, uh, commemoration of the day when uh, Professor C. V. Raman uh, sort of announced uh, the effect, which is known after his name as Raman effect. And um, uh, I mean, one should not say it, but thanks to the pandemic, we have been able to get some uh, great lecturers. In fact, last year on this day, I mean, today we have, as we heard, uh, Professor Sur, who is an alumnus of IIT Kanpur. Last year on this day, we had um, an alumnus of my IIT, that is IIT Bombay. Okay, I mean, he was from the West Coast. And it's a great uh, pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this event. And um, uh, we are all looking forward, I'm sure all of us, uh, whoever is on YouTube and Zoom, they're looking forward to this wonderful lecture from you. And welcome once again, uh, back to Ravi. Well, thank you, Deepan. And uh, may I now invite uh, Professor S. Ramakrishnan, Director TIFR, to say a few words. Uh, let me join Deepan and Ravi to welcome all of the guests across the globe on behalf of TIFR. It is my particular pleasure in welcoming you for this Science Day lecture at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And a special welcome to Professor Miriganga Sur for accepting our invitation and honoring us with this lecture. I'm looking forward to it. So as has been mentioned before, I think Today, the Science Day is celebrated across the nation, commemorating the discovery of Raman effect by Sir C. V. Raman. This is of special importance to Tata Institute or institution which uh, deals with fundamental research because of uh, everlasting value of the basic science in, uh, in, uh, in this society. And uh, you can witness the last two years, you know, we have seen how the basic science is helping the public at large. In fact, our existence seems to have depended on the value of the basic science which has brought. So it's very important that, uh, you know, we must, uh, we must do basic science, not out of luxury, but it's a necessity for every nation. And uh, also doing basic science research I feel it's the best intellectual exercise for the human mind. Well, talking about human mind, I cannot uh, think of anything else in this year to have the science lecture by Professor Mriganga Sur, who, who is a world-known expert on brain research. I am looking forward to listen to his lecture on how the brain functions, why it does what it does. Certainly, it is going to be an inspiring lecture. We are all eagerly looking forward to it. And finally, again, let me welcome all of you and also as a special welcome to Professor Miruganga Sur for giving us this lecture. Thank you. Ravi. Ravi, you are muted. We can't hear you. Ravi, yeah. you are muted. Yeah. Sure, sure. sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you Professor Amkrishnan. Yeah. Uh, well, now I'm okay. So, thank you, Professor Amkrishnan. And uh, it's now a 
great pleasure for me to invite a colleague of mine who knows Professor Sur and his work uh, quite well. And so it's, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Sudip Tumaiti of the Department of Chemical Sciences to introduce the speaker and uh, start up the lecture. Hi, this is Shudipta Maiti from uh, TIFR, and it's such a pleasure to introduce Professor Vikankar Shur. Uh, let me just start from the context of, uh, of uh, the Science Day. If I think of a man on the street or woman on the street thinking about science, the wonderment of the science you know, makes you feel small. You, you think of the planet, you think of the galaxy, you go beyond, and you finally ask yourself, how can it be that a small uh, human brain comprehend this large universe. So at one extent is the largeness of the universe, at the other extent is the complexity of the brain. And you ask, what am I? You know, what is the human mind? How can it comprehend, make, um, make laws, make hypotheses, test the hypothesis, and uh, finally come up with theories with which the universe runs? So, this understanding of the brain and understanding of human mind was thought to be, about a century ago, was thought to be beyond the tools of physical science. The same way we look at atoms, molecules, and matter didn't seem to be applicable um, in, the, uh, in the realm of the human mind. That all began to change. And especially in the last three decades or so, there has been extraordinary um, extraordinary advancement because of tools of uh, physical sciences have been applied to the brain. And today's speaker, Professor Vigankar Shur, has been at the forefront of many of these discoveries. He has taught us how the brain develops, how the brain comprehends things, how can we think of the brain as a plastic circuit, so that is things that can change with the experience that we have. Finally, the last part of uh, the title today, How the Brain Gives Rise to the Mind. This is something that I bet every person who has thought of science has wondered about. This is a far from solved um, question, but we'll be, you'll be astounded how much progress has really been made. And perhaps it needed an engineer to make the progress. He had to make his tools and Professor Megan Kasur was an undergraduate in electrical engineering in IIT Kanpur, from which he uh, went to Vanderbilt University. And I suspect that's where his transformation to a brain scientist began to happen. He got his PhD from there. He did a postdoc at Stony Brook and then quickly was grabbed by Yale University in their faculty. But by that time, this is the late 80s, middle eighties, his fame was already beginning to spread and MIT needed somebody to uh, somebody young to join their brain and cognitive sciences department. And he, uh, you know, and he joined MIT faculty in 1988. From about a decade later, 1997, he has been heading that department for a long 15 years and wonderful things have come out, not only from his lab, but from the brain and cognitive sciences department. Since then, he has been part of the Pico Air Institute for Brain, or another institute uh, within MIT, and has been the Newton Professor of um, Brain and Cognitive Sciences there at MIT. His um, awards and recognitions, obviously, you can imagine, is, um, is wide. He is uh, a member of all the academies that you can think of, including the, he's a fellow of the Royal Society, that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, and, and also the fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, the fellow of uh, several Indian academies of science and uh, uh, other things, other societies. He has won a large number of prizes. The one, the latest I'll just mention because it's a very special one. It's the prize from the Kahal Society. Okay, so Ramani Kahal was the first person I said, you know, about a century ago, things started to change. It was Raman Kahal who put uh, brain sections under the microscope and started delineating the connections between neurons, which, you know, which used to be these uh, black and white pictures in Ra Kahal's notebook that many of us have seen as the beginning of real neuroscience. And you see it in 
Mriganko's data, how alive that picture can be, how the circuits are getting made, how the little calcium sparks are coming up. He has done wonderful thing using the most modern tools of microscopy, multi-photon microscopy, and of course, electrophysiological recordings, and showed us exactly how to think about the brain. I end by saying that uh, he is also wonderful to have as a colleague in, in meetings. I have had the good fortune to sit with him in committees, judging um, the other scientists, other institutes. And you should see the, the precision and the thoughtfulness with, with, with uh, the incisive thinking with which he puts the whole the results and all of the results and all of the judgment, but with the compassion also for a fellow scientist that he comes up with. And this is what to me an ideal scientist should be. I'm sure you'll see all parts of that um, of him today in the 45 minutes. And I invite Professor Migankasu to deliver his lecture now. Just say thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Siripto. And uh, Professor Shur, it's over to you now. Uh, so we'll have a lecture. I just want to tell the audience that you can post the questions in the chat box and we will take them up uh, you know, at the end of the session. So Professor Suar will lecture for something like 45 minutes or so. So hold your breath and listen to all the exciting stuff that's going to follow. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Sudipta, for your very kind words. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ghosh, Professor Ramakrishnan, Professor Ravindran for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be speaking on the National Science Day uh, uh, on behalf of the TIFR Alumni Association. So thank you. Well, today I'm going to share with you uh, our work and place it in the context of the field of perhaps what uh, some uh, have called perhaps the greatest question of our time, which is how does the brain work? How does the brain, which is a mass of about one kilogram uh, uh, and volume of about a liter sitting inside our skull, how does it give rise to the extraordinary capacities of the human mind up to and including thinking about who we are, where did we come from, uh, 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 even how the brain itself works, uh, 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 a question that go to the essence of who we are and how we function. So um, So we have to start with the proposition that the human brain gives rise to the mind. This is not a metaphysical uh, you know, question or issue. The human brain has nearly 80 billion with a B neurons or electrically excitable brain cells. The human brain has an equal number of other non-neuronal cells. But together, these cells or these individual entities, biological entities, their activity creates cognition. And what is cognition? Cognition is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought experience and the senses. Essentially, most people have an intuitive understanding of cognition as everything that the mind does. And in fact, that is correct. Commonly, cognition refers to mental activity underlying perceiving or understanding or learning or memory or attention, communication, reasoning, anything that the mind does can be thought of as cognition. And we have cognition. And I'm going to argue that other organisms, particularly higher organisms with well-defined nervous systems also have cognition in the sense of the physical acts of perceiving or understanding or learning or memory, attention, et cetera. Even things that are soft and fuzzy that constitute thinking, such as attention, such as memory, uh, un, uh, 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 form the basis of cognition and are due to the physical stuff of the brain. So the brain 
consists of importantly of neurons. What are neurons? Neurons are brain cells that are, they are discrete brain cells. Uh, Shudipka mentioned Kahal. Kahal famously drew the structure of brain cells from many different parts of the brain, from many different species. And there is a tremendous universe, universality as well as specificity about brain cells. They may look different, but they share two fundamental commonalities. Brain cells have a cell body, they have dendrites where they get inputs and they have an axon that provides output where it connects to other cells. But the two fundamental commonalities that every brain cell in every species has is first that it has an excitable membrane. The brain cell fires action potentials due to sodium rushing down from outside to inside down its concentration gradient and potassium rushing out from inside to outside down its concentration gradient, leading to such spikes. A Nobel Prize was given to Hodgkin and Huxley in the early 60s for their discovery in the 50s of the ionic basis of the action potential, which underlies a semi-permeable membrane that each cell has made up of lipids, a lipid bilayer, fats that keep sodium out and potassium in, allowing for the action potential to happen. Later, another Nobel Prize was given to Roderick McKinnon for discovering that there are ion channels in the membrane that are what is called voltage gated. When the voltage changes inside the cell, then there is this regenerative rush of sodium ions rushing in followed by potassium ions rushing out. The second deep property of a neuron is that a neuron connects with other neurons at specialized junctions called synapses. A neuron physically ends. It does not physically connect to all other cells in the body in the sense of being continuous. So neuron one ends at hundreds or thousands of synapses where the electrical action potential can no longer propagate. So it gives rise to chemical transmission where a chemical called a transmitter is released it binds to other specialized proteins on cell number two called receptors, which open, allow ions such as calcium and sodium to an, or chloride to pass, which changes the voltage in the second cell, in cell number two. And when there is enough summation of these graded voltages, then there is a voltage threshold reach such that cell number two then fires a spike or action potential. It is more complicated than it needs to be, but we carry within us the seeds of our evolution that if cell number one connected physically to all cells, cells two through a thousand, typically a cell in the brain connects to hundreds of other neurons via thousands of synapses, then there would be no scope for modulation. And the essence of synapses is to make networks and circuits with subsets of target neurons in order to make entities, circuits that process information and by modulating the activity in one cell at synapses. All information in the brain is encoded in the electrical activity of neurons. There is no information in the height of the neuron. All the information is in the interval or in, or, or in the spacing of the electrical spikes. Keep that in mind because as we try to understand cognition, we will invoke the information in electrical spikes, the information in circuits of cells that lead to dynamic activity, what we call dynamics. All right. So with one slide, I want to introduce you to the problem and the issues of cognition and the wonderment of cognition. These are four self-portraits by a German artist named Anton Redescher. And this set of drawings is about 50 years old. And some months before he made these drawings, Redescheid had a stroke. So a stroke is a phenomena whereby a piece of the brain is deprived of blood and of oxygen. And that's because the blood vessels that bring blood to the brain the brain is tremendously energy consuming. 
That's because these transporters that keep sodium out and potassium in, they work very hard. These ions have to be pushed back out once an action potential has happened, pushed back to the other side of the membrane, and that requires a lot of energy. It's like pushing a ball up a hill. So this energy is made possible by blood bringing glucose and oxygen to brain cells. And when this blood is stopped due to either a blood clot in a blood vessel of the brain or due to a hemorrhage, then neurons do not get oxygen and glucose and they die. The other unique thing about brain cells is that they don't regenerate. When they die, if I cut my skin, the wound will heal because cells on either side of the, of the cut will grow over and paper over the cut. Not so for the overwhelming majority of cells in the brain. And there are evolutionary reasons for that too. So, but the problem with brain cells not regenerating is that when brain cells die due to a stroke, then you lose function because the function that is embodied in that circuit or in that brain region is gone. So Redescheid looks at a mirror and he draws a self-portrait shown in the top left. And then two months later, he looks at the mirror again and draws another portrait. And a few months later, he draws another one. And then a few months later, he draws another one. A trained neurologist can take one look at this portrait and tell you where his stroke was. But I'll tell you where it was. It was in this right parietal cortex, meaning in the middle of the brain, middle of the, middle of the cerebral cortex and on the right side. And we know that because we know that is a brain region that is involved in spatial attention, paying attention to objects on the other side of the world, meaning each side of the brain deals with the other side of the world. The right side of the, of the brain deals with the left side of the world. Anything on the left side of visual space is seen on the right side of the brain through complex intercrossing pathways from the eye to the brain. There is nothing wrong with Redescheid's ability to see per se, because he can turn his eyes or he can report what's there. There is nothing wrong with his ability to draw, but there is something profoundly wrong with his ability to interpret objects in the left visual field and integrate them into meaningful entities. So Redashai draws one eye and half a nose and half a mouth, leaving the left side of his face completely blank. And then his next picture still shows poverty on the left side of his drawing. And then Redashai knows something is wrong because each part of the brain communicates with other parts of the brain and that is tremendous, particularly in us, self-reflection. So he draws his face turned away and then Redescheid was lucky that the parts of the brain that were not damaged, including not every cell that is deprived of oxygen dies immediately and sometimes new vessels develop, sometimes the brain on the other side can take over lost functions due to plasticity. And so function recovered for the most part for Redescheid. But that's not very common necessarily for people in older ages, such as me, who may get a stroke. So this is a particular example of cognition, spatial attention and this example shows that cognition arises from an internal representation of the world. Redescheid's eyes are fine. He can represent the world. The world can be represented in his brain, but the world has to be reconstructed in his brain in a manner that enables cognition. And this internal representation of the world involves specific brain regions such as the right parietal cortex. And of course, this brain region is made up of networks of neurons and their activity, hence network circuits and dynamics. So Shudipto referred to technologies that have begun to transform our understanding of the brain. How might we understand phenomena such as Redescheid, even in the human brain, but can we derive principles by which cognition happens. 
which means looking deep into the brain, trying to understand the brain regions, circuits, neurons, and even synapses at an appropriate level of understanding. And the Nobel Prize winning biologist Sidney Brenner famously said, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. And so indeed, new technologies are transforming neuroscience and cognitive science. And these technologies span many levels of many orders of scale from functional magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography at the scale of millimeters to recording the activity, even in humans, but certainly in animals and animal models of disease, recording the activity via electrical, uh, uh, recording the electrical activity via electrodes or via optical methods going down into the level of single neurons, single synapses, and even single molecules inside synapses over five orders of magnitude. Tools are being developed that enable us to look at unprecedented detail into the brain. When you ask my lab, in the study is about three or four orders of a spatial scale using multiple tools that we have either developed or, or, or have adapted. And indeed, new technologies combined with new questions that are always revealed lead to new ideas about how the brain works and how to give rise to cognition. Today, I'll be talking at the mesoscale level, at the level of single neurons and circuits that they form in trying to understand the elements of cognition. So, our work and the work of, of a significant subset of the field deals with visual cognition. That's because vision happens automatically, but vision is really created in the brain. Vision begins with the eyes, but the eyes provide information to brain structures, particularly the primary visual cortex here at the back of the brain called V1. And then there are some 30 to 35 different brain regions in the back half of the brain, as well as in the front of the brain that deal directly or indirectly with vision from the spots of light that the eye sends the, the brain. The brain puts together the recognition of objects, the recognition of people, the movement of eyes, the movement of hands and our bodies, and all of the things that we associate with visual cognition. So visual cognition arises from a distributed hierarchy of cortical areas and networks. I should mention that the cerebral cortex of the brain is 80% of the brain in us, and the vast majority of complex computations in the brain take place in the cerebral cortex, albeit with close interactions with subcortical evolutionarily older structures. So in the cerebral cortex of our brain, there is a hierarchy that, 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 is, that, is, that is a parallel as well as serial processing of information exemplified by the visual system through all these different areas. But importantly, I want to mention two other areas in addition to the primary visual cortex. The parietal cortex and the frontal cortex. I've already told you about the parietal cortex in Anton Redescheidt's brain where there was a stroke. And you know that the parietal cortex is deeply involved in spatial attention or in phenomena that take visual information and transform it. But in addition to the visual or the primary visual cortex and the parietal cortex, there, is, there are regions in the frontal cortex of the brain, in the front of the brain that are also involved with visual, and vision mediated processing, such as moving the eyes or moving the hands to locations where we want to pick up something or attend to it. And so today I'm going to talk about three components of cognition in, in the next uh, 30 or so minutes. Visual cognition engages attention. I've already mentioned a little bit about that. Attention is an internal state where of all the things we could see, 
we only see some or all the things that are happening around us, we only deal with some. Attention is a crucial mechanism for shaping and filtering information. We cannot pay equal energy or equal computations on everything. Attention is absolutely essential to cognition. I'll tell you about working memory. This is yet another component of thought that short-term memory as opposed to long-term memory, these are two very different, related but different mechanisms. And there is a growing understanding that short-term memory, holding, holding things in our head for a short time to link different parts of an event is really a crucial component of attention. And finally, I'll tell you about reasoning. You might think that reasoning, such questions, how might we experimentally address them? And I'll show you how even in animal models, we can actually address components of reasoning that arise from learning and are closely related to mechanisms of learning, such as reinforcement learning. So the brain develops, and I don't have time to talk about the development and developmental plasticity of the brain that Shudikta mentioned. A lot of our work is devoted to that. The brain develops with information from genes as well as by information from the outside world. And the information from the outside world gets embodied in brain circuits through mechanisms of plasticity. And in the language of computation, we would call that unsupervised learning. There is no teacher, the outside world, which is made up of visual objects, which, have, which are bounded by segments and lines and so forth. They, in fact, influence the development of circuits in the visual cortex such that in the brain, in the visual cortex, we have neurons that are sensitive to oriented line segments. But then in the adult brain or after as development proceeds, there are other forms of learning, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And I'll talk a lot about reinforcement learning as we go along. But first, I'm going to talk to you about attention. Then I'll talk to you about working memory. And finally, in the last bit of my talk, I'll talk to you about reasoning and our experiments that speak to these three components of cognition. So attention filters and focuses information from the world. And perceptual attention, paying attention to something that happens is a crucial substrate for cognition, including memory or decisions or action. If you do not attend to something, if you are not attending to my talk, it is very unlikely you will remember any of it. You have to attend. You have to ignore all the other things that are happening, hopefully ignore around you, even that, that, that you and I are sitting on a chair and there is some pressure on our behind and we are wearing clothes, et cetera. All of that is happening around us. But we have to attend in order to remember and attention leads to decisions which leads to action. So already you can see how core a feature of cognition attention is. Disruption of cognition reveals the brain's attention networks. And the parietal cortex is a locus of attention, not only in Anton Radoscheid, but in many other people, because the right parietal cortex is unfortunately an important locus of stroke, because there are many blood vessels that come up through the middle cerebral artery and they, they get finer and finer. And it is, a, it is not an uncommon locus of blockade of the blood vessels, hence this region gets devoid of blood and hence of oxygen during a stroke. And in these patients with a stroke on the right side, if you ask them to draw a watch, they draw only one side of the watch. They ignore the other side. It's an astonishing thing. You ask them to draw a house, they only draw half a house, half, the, half, this, half this flower. It's not that they cannot see, they ignore it. They do not attend to that side. Hence the parietal cortex, we know from such quote unquote lesion studies is a locus of attention. 
how are internal states such as attention created in the brain? To ask this question, I'm going to take you, to answer this question, I'm going to take you into a deep, deep dive. You cannot study questions at the level of neurons and circuits, even at the level of synapses, particularly at the level of synapses in the human brain. We just don't have access. We need animal models. You can do some things in the human brain, such as fun functional imaging, but that doesn't tell you in a satisfactory way, to my mind, how do the elements of cognition, how do the brain networks and circuits and their dynamics work? For that, we need to record the activity, the electrical activity of not only one cell, but large numbers of cells and relate them to each other and use computational principles to derive what information do they contain, what information are they transmitting to other parts of the brain, and how might this information be interpreted? So my lab has studied different animal species. And over the years, macaque monkeys, more recently, marmosets. We have studied an animal called a ferret, which is a carnivore. But for the last 15 or so years, we have focused on mice. And why mice? Well, mice diverged from humans about 100 million years ago. But first, they have all the brain regions that characterize the human brain, at least conceptually. So a mouse is not a small human by any means. If you look at the human brain and you blow up the mouse brain, which by the way is 1,000 the volume of a human brain. So a human brain, I told you, has 80 billion neurons and a mouse brain has about 50 to 55 million neurons, an adult mouse. But first, the visual cortex shown in blue, the motor cortex shown in red, the parietal cortex shown in green, and the frontal cortex also exist in mice, albeit in much altered proportions. The parietal and frontal cortex are much smaller, nonetheless, anatomically, and to some extent functionally, at, at a fundamental level, one can ask and answer questions about the function of these so-called higher order areas, even in the mouse brain. The second reason to study mice is that mice can be, mice are wonderful genetic models in the sense that to use very advanced tools such as multiphoton imaging, we need to convert the electrical activity of neurons into signals that can be measured with light. By using lasers, we can study at unprecedented resolution the activity of single neurons, in theory, every one of the 50 million neurons. In practice, many hundreds to thousands of neurons at a time, and there are many thousands of synapses at a time using lasers, but also taking advantage of the fact that in mouse brain, you can express genes that express proteins that convert the electrical activity into fluorescence. And that change in fluorescence with every spike can be read out by multiphoton technologies that can scan the brain at high resolution. So this allows unprecedented measurements. So we can take mice and we can study attention. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, a mouse shown here and the kinds of behavior that we train the mice on because our Goal is to make the mouse attend or not attend, force it to not attend and ask what changed? What happens in the brain when a mouse does this, but not that? And we can do this by training a mouse. So my students and postdocs who work on these projects are like circus trainers. Just like if you have been to a circus, you can see, or if you have a dog or a cat, not a cat, a cat is very difficult to train, but a dog can be trained to do many different things by rewarding the actions that you wish for the animal to do. This is called reinforcement learning. So through reinforcement learning, we can train a mouse to look at a screen. And when there are horizontal bars, say moving up or down, we can say, now you should lick. 
this is a stimulus that will bring you a reward. When there are vertical bars that are moving left and right, we say, you must not lick. And not only must you not lick, if you do lick, we will punish you with a little drop of quinine. And so the mouse's task is to tell us it is seeing a horizontal set of gratings by licking, that's called a hit, it gets a reward. When there is a vertical gratings, it should not lick, and that's called a correct reject. And the mistakes happen when the mouse licks when it shouldn't, meaning that it licks to the non-target, that's called a false alarm, or when it doesn't lick to a target, and that's called a miss. And this is a well-defined two by two matrix of behavioral contingencies, and we can derive D primes, which is how, what is the mouse's decision boundary in terms of, and we can make these, we can make these gratings brighter or with more contrast or less contrast, and we can actually play with the mouse's visual cognition or try to understand mechanisms of cognition through these behavioral measures. Today, I'm just going to show you the basic, uh, basic behavior and use it to probe attention. So the mouse gets a cue, then a stimulus will come on, and then this lick spout will go forward as soon as the stimulus goes off. And the mouse has been trained to respond to the target stimulus, horizontal bars with licks, or to withhold licking when the stimulus is vertical. So here, I hope you can see the mouse. I hope you can see the lick spout. That is a, that is a screen at the back. There'll be gratings on the screen. And then when the grating goes off, this lick spout will come forward and you'll be able to see the mouse's tongue come out and lick for a target or not lick the, 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 the reward when, there is, when it's a non-target, okay? So here's the mouse twitching. And then here is the target grating and then the mouse licks then this lick spot comes forward, okay? And now you will see the non-target grade and the mouse does not lick and so forth, okay? Now, so, and the mouse licks again for this target and that's a hit. All right, we can play a game with this mouse. We can say, we will show you the, the stimulus, the target or the non-target stimulus, but, we will not bring the lick spout forward. So now we have two conditions. Then engaged condition where the mouse is doing this task and is able to lick because we bring the lick spout forward or the passive condition when we do not bring the lick spout forward. And so the mouse knows that even if I see a target grating, these people are fooling with me they will not give me a reward because the lick spout is not coming forward for this entire block of trials. These 20, 30, 40 trials, I should switch off because why spend energy in this game in which I'm not going to get a reward? And so indeed the mouse switches off and we know that the mouse has switched off because we can monitor the mouse's pupil, the eye. We can put a small laser on the eye and, and image the pupil. And when we attend, when you and I attend, when a mouse attends, our pupils slightly dilate. And we know that during these passive trials, the mouse is not engaged because this pupil is not dilated. And of course, the animal cannot lick and the animal's decision boundary is not measurable because it is not making any decisions at all. So during all this then, we can measure the activity of the brain using lasers and two photon imaging. And that's what a two photon setup looks like. We express this calcium indicator called GCAM in neurons of the brain, particularly in visual cortex and the parietal cortex in this experiment. And we scan this region while the mouse is doing the task, either with a set of engaged trials or a set of passive trials. And we can ask, what do these neurons do? And these neurons are flashing. Every flash is a spike. And we can scan this at several tens of hertz in order to measure these very fast electrical spikes now measured as calcium spikes in each of these neurons, hundreds of neurons. And what do we find? 
what we find is that in the primary visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain that gets input from the eyes through the visual thalamus, there are neurons that like either horizontal bars or vertical bars. And here is a neuron that likes a set of vertical bars, which is shown here in red, shown uh, and that, uh, that like a set of horizontal bars, I apologize. The horizontal bars are the target and I have outlined them in red. And when the horizontal bars come on, shown in red, this neuron fires this big calcium burst. This neuron's activity doesn't depend on whether the mouse is engaged or is passive, then whether the mouse is getting a reward or not getting a reward. When the visual stimulus comes on, neurons in the visual cortex are activated if they respond to horizontal gratings. Other neurons that respond to vertical gratings will be activated regardless of what the mouse's task is or what its behavior is or what it has learned to do. But in the parietal cortex, the activity of neurons is strongly dependent on whether or not the mouse is paying attention or the mouse is engaged. In the engaged condition, here is a neuron that is firing when the mouse is able to respond and has therefore transformed the visual stimulus into an action. Whereas in the passive condition, there is no action, there is no attention and the same neuron is, is silent. And that's what you see here but a neuron in the engaged and passive condition in the primary visual cortex, there is a lot of activity uh, uh, to the same stimulus. Whereas in the posterior parietal cortex, this neuron is only active when the mouse is engaged or attending and able to, to respond, but not at all for the same neuron when the mouse is passive. And so I remind you that the design of such experiments to look at internal conditions is that the physical stimulus is the same. It is the internal representation of that stimulus, whether or not the animal is attending to that stimulus when the man animal is engaged, whereas it's not attending when it's passive. That is what is different. And that difference is captured, in fact, is represented by the activity of the parietal cortex but not of the visual cortex. We can continue this experiment by switching the contingency. We can ask if instead of the horizontal stimuli being the target, what if we make the vertical stimuli the target? So that now the animal will get rewarded when it sees vertical stimuli. It's as if you learned that red means stop, and now you are learning Green is stop, okay? For those of us who are culturally conditioned, this is actually sometimes deeply uncomfortable. It tells you how important reinforcement learning is. We are not born with knowing red means stop and green means go, but we learn it. It's something deeply learned and it makes us uncomfortable when these contingencies change. For a mouse, you know, uh, 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 the mouse was taught, one thing means go, another thing means don't go, and now we have switched it. The mouse learns it quite quickly, actually, this, this a switch. And we know that it learns it because the decision boundary flips over to now being sensitive to the vertical gradients. That's what the, the B prime says. What happens to the neurons? In the visual cortex, a neuron that responds to horizontal bars continues to respond to horizontal bars even though the contingency of the reinforcement has now been switched. Now we are rewarding vertical bars, but the, this neuron continues to do, and we know it's the same neuron over weeks of training. That's the other amazing thing about working with mice and working with genetically engineered calcium indicators in identified neurons. We can record from the same neuron over days and weeks, and the same neuron continues to respond to its original stimulus because that's what it has created from its visual inputs as its window on the world. It is not a function of animals learning or behavior. But in the parietal cortex, a neuron that used to respond to horizontal gratings because that was reward inducing, now flips. The same neuron now begins to respond to the vertical gratings. And so what does this tell us? It tells us 
that neurons in the primary visual cortex at the back of the brain reflect the sensory stimulus. Whereas neurons in the parietal cortex, one stage higher in the hierarchy from vision to action, these neurons respond to the rewarded stimulus and they are responsible for transforming vision to action. And it also tells us as a core physical substrate of this deeply mystical thing called attention that we cannot see, that we cannot touch. But what is attention? At least one important component of attention that it reflects action selection. It reflects the transformation of horizontal visual stimuli into a now lick command that goes to the motor cortex, which then initiates looking. And, in, and the act of this transformation is what attention may be defined as empirically. We can derive machine learning, you can, we can use machine learning algorithms to ask, what is the nature of information represented in the population of parietal cortex neurons? We can build support vector machine uh, uh, algorithms to ask if you have a population of primary, uh, of parietal cortex or primary visual cortex neurons, if somebody is looking at it, how can they tell what is being encoded? So these are called decoders. And you have a population of neurons, they have one set of dynamics, one set of activity or another. Can you draw a hyperplane through these two sets of activities such that something downstream, the motor cortex downstream of the, or the frontal cortex downstream of parietal cortex can say, I have received the signal to lick. Okay, remember, there is no experimenter sitting in the brain. One part of the brain has to interpret the activity of another through principled means. And decoders are, we presume, one such statistical means of reading out the activity that one brain region provides to another. So we can use time-resolved decoding analysis using support vector machine, hyperplanes to distinguish what we call stationary from dynamic coding. So here's a set of neurons. We record them at one point and we decode them. We record them at another point, we decode them at the same time. We record them at another point and we decode them. And posterior parietal cortex provide a very good indicator of now lick or now don't lick. And the black traces are training and testing a different decoder at each time step. But if you build a decoder at, if you record the set of activities at one time and you ask how long, how stable is this set of activity over the duration of the trial? Can this decoder work for the entire time? Those are shown in the colored traces. And what it shows is that no, the decoder only can decode activity for a couple of seconds, but then it fails. And, and, and so on throughout the trial. And what it means is that in the parietal cortex, there is dynamic encoding of choice, unlike in the visual cortex where neurons respond to one orientation or another throughout these stimulus presentation. It is not a dynamic in the sense of the sensitivity changing over time encoding. And so the Encoding of neurons in the visual cortex is relatively independent of time, whereas in posterior parietal cortex, it is dependent on the dynamics of the task. As we look around, we are constantly deciding, should we do this or that? So is the mouse. And the parietal cortex is transforming that visual stimulus into action. I'm running late, so I'm going to speed up. Parietal cortex are flexibly reconfigured during the transformation of vision to action. And what this tells us is that learning, the act of learning the visual discrimination and the computation, the representation of that learned behavior in the population of neurons are embodied in the same parietal neurons. This is an amazing thing about the brain. In, a, in your computer, your memory and your processor are two different things. It's called a von Neumann architecture. And a lot of time and effort is spent in moving things in and out from memory to processor and back. Not so in the brain. In the brain, 
memory and, and, and computation are in the same neuron that makes for amazingly efficient processing, it gives rise to challenges. How stable is the computation? How can stable computation be performed? Very quickly, I'll tell you about working memory and how the illustrious dynamics of cognition in circuits. So it's the same task, except that now we have added a delay between the stimulus and the action or the choice. So you'll see here that now that is the go stimulus and there is a delay, N nothing is happening for six seconds in this case. And then the leg spout comes forward and the animal leg. So the animal has to hold in memory during these three or six seconds, what it should do. And then when it's allowed to lick, it should lick or not lick. And this we can study, what is the mechanism in the mind of working memory by asking, what are the neuronal activities during this delay period? What does it mean to hold something in memory? And now we can record from the primary visual cortex, and from the parietal cortex, but also from this motor cortex that is executing this action, this vision initi initiated, visual discrimination based action of licking or not licking. And what we find is that in the motor cortex shown here in red, we see the signature of the delay, where during the stimulus that is activity that comes up and the activity continues to be high in motor cortex neurons. These are 320 motor cortex neurons. In the sum that continues to be high. That is the internal representation of time, the activity during a delay. And I remind you that during the delay period, there is nothing in front of the animal. The stimulus used to exist and now it's gone and the reward spout will come forward, but not yet. There is nothing in front of the animal, yet that is activity in the motor cortex as representing an internal state of working memory. So this is another way in which we study internal states by forcing the stimulus to be either the same as in the case of attention or no stimulus at all, just holding the, the, the memory in mind. How might we analyze these kinds of data? How does the population activity in visual parietal motor cortex encode past components? So now the brain has billions of neurons and this leads to a very high dimensional space. You can imagine if there are three neurons, these three neurons are firing at different times, it leads to a trajectory in three dimensional space. If you have hundreds of neurons, there are hundreds of dimensional spaces, high dimension. We need to boil them down into their into principal components and we can derive trajectories. These are ideas derived from control theory in the reduced dimensional space. When we do that in the primary visual cortex, we can show that the principal components of these neurons are stimulus driven shown in blue. When the stimulus comes on, these neurons, one set of neurons responds to vertical grating, another set of neurons responds to horizontal gratings, and during the delay and during the licking time or response time, they all come back to baseline. There is no more information than about the stimulus in these neurons. But in the motor cortex, we see something amazing and remarkable. We see that during the stimulus itself shown in blue, the activity rises, then it goes into an attractor basin where the activity sits. And then these sets of neurons are other sets of neurons the other principal component makes the action possible by being active during the licking. And, and this happens due to a specific set of circuits in the motor cortex that I'm not going to go into, but motor cortex activity reflects working memory and the behavioral response. And how does this happen? What is this working memory? And by other experiments we have shown, but you can see right here, that this working memory is the motor plan. It is not the memory of the stimulus, but of the meaning of the stimulus. That during the stimulus itself, visual cortex is responding, shown in blue. The parietal cortex is responding, shown in green, as I showed you a little while ago. But the motor cortex also begins to respond. The parietal cortex has already converted 
vision to action, but it is not moving anything. It is sending its signals to the motor cortex. And the motor cortex has to create a plan, hold it and execute it when the lip spout comes forward so that the animal can live. So that this memory is the memory of the motor plan. And so the activity in motor cortex builds during the stimulus and reflects rapid dynamic motor planning for action in the world. What have we learned so far? We have learned that brain networks are flexible and reconfigurable, enabling cognitive states such as attention and cognitive functions such as learning, decisions, and action, action selection. Whereas neural dynamics in brain ne networks such as the frontal cortex enable functions such as working memory and action planning. And flexible architectures configured by learning likely underlie some of the highest attributes of the human mind, such as imagination and creativity. How much time do I have? Do I have five more minutes? Because then I can tell you about reasoning or I can just stop here. No, I, I think go ahead, please. It, it's really- Is nice. that okay? Sorry yeah, about sure. that. Sure. All right. Now, there's been a lot of talk about what aspects of cognition are really capturable in computers. Can computers really do cognition? Can computers think? And in the early 70s, in the days of old fashioned AI, where AI was thought to be achievable by symbolic representations alone, a philosopher named Hubert Dreyfus wrote a book called What Computers Can't Do. And he said, computers will never be able to do symbolic manipulations that the human brain does as it learns language or as it does the highest levels of cognition. And then 20 years later, the field of machine learning or at least artificial intelligence moved into connectionist models, moving away from symbolic representations alone. And Dreyfus reissued that same book, but with a different introduction called What Computers Still Can't Do. So that's one way uh, for us scientists to get two publications from one. Uh, and indeed, Dreyfus has a point that there are deep aspects of the human mind, such as thinking, though we have tried to whittle away at thought by asking questions about attention and memory, which are also immaterial things, yet have material basis. But phenomena like understanding, would a computer really understand? Can a computer really think in the way that we think we do? And there has been some progress in one subset of this question. This is a big question that speaks to reasoning that to my mind suggests, if there are laws that we can understand, laws of cognition, it is very likely that a computer, a general purpose computer may be able to implement it. And I'll give you a flavor of this in the, in the last five minutes. And I apologize for going over. How should we think about reasoning in even and humble an animal as a mouse? Does the mouse brain have signatures of reasoning defined as actions to optimize behavior? And I submit the mouse reasons. Why do I think so? We look at something unusual. And you, you might think it's unusual. I think it's off the essence, which is error trials. Why does the mouse make a mistake? When does it make a mistake and why does it make a mistake? But the mouse has been taught. If this happens, lick. If this happens, don't lick. And the mouse's you know, water intake depends on doing this task correct. There is no virtue to not doing it incorrectly. So the mouse you think should learn. It's a simple task. Yet, Yet, even the most highly trained mouse makes mistakes. And the mistakes are of two kinds. One kind is boring, but the other kind is profoundly interesting. Here's the boring kind. The mouse sees a target. It should lick. We know that the mouse's brain sees that target because here are neurons in the visual cortex that are responsive to the stimulus. But the mouse does not lick. It is not paying attention 
its primary, its, its parietal cortex has zero activity. And so the mouse does not let, that's called the mess. Then the mouse, when a target is presented and the mouse does not let, it's called the mess. And it misses behaviorally because its brain misses. It's paying attention to something else. It, it, it feels like scratching or something happened, whatever happens to all of us. That's the boring kind. The more interesting kind is when the mouse should not lick and it licks, that's called a false alarm. So in the visual cortex of the mouse, there are again neurons that respond to this vertical stimulus, right? So the visual cortex is telling the brain what the stimulus is. And in the correct reject, the parietal cortex and the motor cortex are silent. The mouse should not lick. There is no activity in this brain region. In the false alarm case, there is activity. That is why the mouse licks. And you can see that as this, what is called positive error mod modulation. Why should the mouse lick when its brain is telling it, it is the wrong stimulus? I submit to you that this speaks to a deep aspect of reinforcement learning, and which is that the brain must explore in order to decide the optimal course of action and that is what underlies exploitation. And this relationship from exploration to exploitation is at the core of reinforcement learning. To give you a very simple example, I live about a mile, 1.2 miles from my lab. And I walk or I occasionally drive and Google Maps will tell me this is the optimal way shown in blue. But if I just do that, I would never figure out, are there better times? Are there shorter times at different times of day, et cetera? And in fact, most of the time, I choose this green path, which is quite a bit longer. If you can read it, it's 1.4 miles as opposed to 1.2 miles, but it has one less red light. And it has much less traffic than this very heavily traveled Broadway. So I must explore in order to meaningfully exploit. I must choose a policy that maximizes value. I must choose a path out of multiple paths that maximizes my reward. You know, this is, you might think, what does this have to do with computation or with artificial intelligence or with intelligence per se? It has everything to do with it. It has everything to do with a small component, a critical component in my mind of cognition. Artificial neural networks have had remarkable success in games with perfect information and deep search. What are these games? These are games like chess or a game like Go, which are two player, they are zero sum. If one wins, the other must lose. Deterministic, meaning that there is a set number and kind of moves. They are discrete moves. One person moves, the other person moves. Each piece moves in a known way. They are Markov, there is no history. A player can walk in to another player's game and play from that point on. And all of this leads to perfect simulation of game states. So using deep force, using brute force, policy choices. The IBM computer, Deep Blue, big then champion, Gary Kasparov. In 2016, a program called AlphaGo from a, from a group called DeepMind used reinforcement learning and policy and value calculations to beat the Go champion least at all. And then in 2018, a general purpose algorithm with no human intervention taught itself to play chess and Go and beat the reigning chess game engine. Because once Gary Kasparov was beaten, the most advanced chess games no longer take place between human chess players. They, they take place between chess engines. And of course, I remind you that the number of moves in these games is unbelievably large. What does all this mean? Very quickly, in the first program that was built by the DeepMind group, they took human games and used the human games to teach and, and by human curating, taught a reinforcement learning algorithms to derive policy and hence value using Monte Carlo searches through the space of moves. 
Later, they did away with the human stuff and taught the Go program to do self-play by teaching them the rules of each move and what constitutes winning and losing. And then the general reinforcement algorithm that taught itself through zillions of moves to play without any human intervention by just being told this is how pieces move and this is what it means to win or lose. And this program called Alpha Zero beat the current top chess engine with, which had this ELO rating of 3000. I remind you that Magnus Carlsen has an ELO rating of 2882 and Vishwanath Anand has ELO rating of 2700 and Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, who just beat Magnus, has an ELO rating of 2600. So these are way above those ELO ratings. Now, when this program was built, Vishwanath Anand has this, had this in a comment. This, of course, taught, the program taught itself. There was no human intervention except for this is how the pieces are moving. But the critical, the critical driver of the, of the engine was logical ways, was principal ways to determine policy and that. And Vishwanath Anand said it feels annoying that it would learn the rules of chess quickly. But at the heart of this, and, and I'm coming to my last slide, is where does this reasoning come from when a computer has taught itself to play? And in fact, the computer's moves are astonishing. The computer, this, this alpha uh, uh, go zero. If I were to be presented this in the chessboard, I, as a very humble chess player, might choose one of these red moves or I might choose the yellow move, but the computer chose this move. It's a very aggressive move because it presents this, 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 this position has only one force from the white and two from the black, but it clears out lanes. In fact, Gary Kasparov, when this paper came out, wrote a commentary on this uh, program. He said, I admit I was pleased to see that Alpha Zero had a dynamic open style like my own. The conventional wisdom was that machines would approach perfection with endless dry maneuvering, leading to drawn games. But in my observation, Alpha Zero prioritizes peace activity over material, preferring positions that to my eye look risky and aggressive. Alpha Zero is this program that taught itself from scratch, no human intervention except for the determining the algorithms for policy in that. Programs usually reflect priorities and prejudices of programmers, but because Alpha Zero programmed itself, I would say that its style reflects the truth. Reflects the truth. What does that mean? What does Kasparov mean? Where does the logic that enables a general purpose computer with Turing architecture, with von Neumann separation of memory and processor? With Boolean logic, none of this has anything in common with the human brain. Nonetheless, it figures out the rules of logic and of the game that not only beats humans, but the most advanced machines. It must be, at least I submit, that this logic that this machine figured out, which is similar to the logic of the human mind, is actually the logic of the universe. So when we have such logic, we can ask, what is it that machines can capture? And there has been a lot of discussion. I don't have time to get into what Turing said, who did say that if a machine passes the Turing test, it can be thought to be intelligent. And Searle said, no, that is not understanding. The history of science is a progressive retreat of the centrality of human beings from being the center of the universe to being the center of life on earth, to now being the center of cognition. But the history of technology is also a history of enormous human ingenuity, where if we decipher the laws of nature, we can build machines that can take advantage of the laws and exceed nature. It is possible that for subsets of cognition, such as reasoning, such achievements would be possible. And so I'll leave you with the idea, technology brings opportunities and challenges, but I hope 
that its gains would be equitably applied and distributed. And I wish to acknowledge the many people in my lab who contributed to the work that I described, at least from my own lab. Thank you. I apologize for going over. I got carried away. <laughs> Sorry about that. So thank you very much for a brilliant exposition. I think, you know, none of us moved while you were talking because it was also fascinating. And uh, what you said towards the end was exciting and equally scary. You know, I mean, you said the centrality of the human mind. We will see if, um, you know, how far co computers will go and make us irrelevant in the future. Um, so uh, if, you, if you have a few minutes, we'll have a few questions for you. Is that okay? Fine. Yeah. So uh, these are questions on the chat box. Um, so uh, a trivial question. Why cannot the left side of the brain infer anything about the... Let me just read it. Uh, yeah, okay. I can, I can read the questions in the chat. So maybe I can just read it out quickly and, uh, yeah, sure. and, and answer uh, briefly. Yeah. Okay, so why can't the left side of the brain infer anything about the same side uh, by uh, Gagan Mohanty? Is it because you cannot lift the chair while sitting on it? Not quite. It is that the, uh, the brain or the nervous systems of even the simplest organisms have evolved to uh, deal with information on the opposite side. And there, are, there, are, there is no good answer to this. There are, there are very simple organisms in which uh, that, that, that do deal bilaterally. And even the human brain does have some bilateral control, uh, uh, particularly through the spinal cord, etc. The lens inverts uh, uh, light rays uh, across left and right, across also across top and bottom. So at least with respect to vision, there is some reason for thinking that one side is reflected in the other side. That doesn't necessarily mean that one side of the brain should deal with the other side of the visual world. Uh, uh, I don't have a good answer to this. This is, this is the way the brain has evolved. And one of the problems with theoretical biology is that it is very difficult to argue biology from first principles because biology is also importantly a story of history. That we are the way we are because through evolution, things that were adaptive have been retained. I'll let it go at that. Yeah. S. Pathak, wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, I, am, I am losing. Okay, can I read? Uh, I, I, I'm losing your questions, okay. So the intent let, let me the let me answer very quickly because I need to leave in about five minutes. Okay. Sure, sure. The intensity of the response seems to be different in the engaged and passive states in the V1 neurons. Do we know why? I don't think it is different. Maybe there are small variations in our recordings, but there is a deeper answer, which is that I may have given you the impression that V1 is totally low level, parietal cortex and frontal cortex are totally high level. It is not so. There is tremendous feedback also onto lower cortical areas and even subcortical areas from higher areas. And so it is true that there is modulation even in the primary visual cortex by internal states, much less. And so you have a point. Uh, so Sudeep Bhattacharya, how can brain give rise to self or I or the ownership of cognition or mind? I'll, I'll give you a very brief answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Shahid, Shahid, Shahid Siddiqui says, excellent talk, where does morality get coded? Oh my. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I should say I don't know, but I will say that in fact, there are regions of the human mind that have been studied with functional magnetic resonance imaging that speak to what is called theory of mind. Or how do we think about other people? So if you and I, uh, Shahid, have a conversation, it is crucial that I know what you are thinking or at least what you mean when you say what you do. 
And for you to understand me, you have to have some idea of my mind. So this is called theory of mind. And there have been some important philosophical writings that say theory of mind, the ability to put oneself in another person's position is at the core of morality. Why should we care that somebody has been unjustly treated? Why should we care about things like justice? Is because we can put ourselves in somebody else's position. And theory of mind is a crucial element. Uh, there's a question by Amol Dige about the- Sorry, yeah. Formula. How does one distinguish between the mouse reasoning, trying a different strategy versus the mouse simply making a mistake and not caring? I'm sorry, what? Uh, is the difference can, between a mouse adopting a strategy versus and, a mouse making a mistake and not caring? Not caring, yeah. Absolutely. We, we do not have access to the mind of the mouse. What we have access is to the brain of the mouse. And from the brain of the mouse, we decipher what is the mind of the mouse. That is the point of neuroscience and of cognitive, of, of, of cognitive neuroscience. So we cannot tell you what is the mouse, whether the mouse doesn't care. But we have to assume that the mouse deeply cares about the consequences of its actions. Otherwise, why bother? So the mouse is, mouse is geared towards getting its water reward. The mouse's life depends on it. Because the way you train, the, the way you train a circus animal is to deprive it of something that it wants. And then you give it that reward through the action that you want it to perform, okay? So the mouse deeply values this reward, the water reward that it gets because it's been deprived of water. So it, it values that water reward because it values its life. So the drive to life, the drive for reward is a very deep drive. And that's why we think the mouse does care and hence, when it does things that seemingly go against its own self-interest in the immediate near term, we think it's actually a self-interest in the long term. Because unless you explore, unless you try something else, you will never explore. And if you don't explore, you will never figure out all the contingencies of the world you are in or the game you are playing. That's the point. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess you have to go. So uh, sorry that you know we kept you for so long. Um, but uh, would you like to take some more, or um, are you? Okay? I can. Uh, yeah. You uh, know, I think I think we are almost done with the questions. So no, you, uh, no, sir. There, there are, are a few questions. On YouTube. There are some questions <laughs> on YouTube. To be fair, okay, maybe I'll take one we'll last question. for a for one a few more minutes. Yeah, Satya, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so there's a question, uh, doesn't one eye, uh, doesn't one eye has enough visual range that would include both the complete model uh, and to see it as a complete image, though one functional part of the brain. Uh, so one eye, one eye doing the entire... One eye. Uh, entire, entire uh, uh, one eye. People with one oh, eye. Yes, yes. One, each eye captures information about a very large part of the visual scene and provides information to both sides of the brain. It is not that one eye provides information only about half the visual world. That's not how it works. Each eye provides information about both halves, but not fully the other half. You can close one eye and you can, you can map your visual. Sure. You can see that. Yeah. So each eye provides information to the information processing machinery to both sides of the brain. Okay, Satya, quickly one more. But, yes, but one the more. two eyes enable us to see in depth and to get additional information because to see in depth, what is called binocular vision, yeah. you need the slight offset of the laterally displaced eyes and the subtle difference, a few minutes, seconds of arc, a visual arc that each object in space subtends on the two eyes, astonishingly, the brain is sensitive to that and derives information about depth. That is not possible to do with one eye alone. With one eye, yeah. But so it's yeah. a subtle point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, the se second question, suppose there is a benign tumor on the right or left parietal cortex and affects left or right side of the body. Uh, can the other part of the brain take over at some uh, time like the painter's example? Sometimes, but a tumor is a very bad thing. You know, brain tumors are usually very uh, 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 mm, serious things, uh, you know. Uh, a brain tumor is a brain cell's developmental program gone wrong. wrong. Usually brain tumors are due to what are called gliomas or the glia or the non-neuronal cells proliferating or dividing in an uncontrolled way. So it's difficult to regulate this. It leads to bad things. It has wide scale effects. And if you remove the tumor, possibly other brain regions on the same side, on the other side could, in fact, are known to take over functions for at least a while. I think Satya will have to stop yeah. here. Sure. Uh, because uh, Professor Shur has to go. So before, uh, so we want to thank you for taking time out and giving a wonderful uh, lecture that's going to provoke lots of thoughts. And I'm sure people will send you emails and ask you more questions. And I hope it's okay with you that you know, they approach you again. And I want to thank, uh, before I close, I want to thank uh, Shumantro Shona Chatterjee at uh, NCBST IFR Bangalore for getting us in touch with you and using his good influence to pull you into this lecture to get you to say yes. So Shumantro was unfortunately traveling today and he couldn't join, but he has sent, um, you know, he said that he'll make up some other time. He'll, he'll talk to you at leisure. So thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure for all of us. So on behalf of the TFR Alumni Association, um, thank you once thank again you. and uh, wish you, yeah, uh, you have, Ramki, you have a, somebody else spoke up just now? All right. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much for all, right. yeah. all your okay. time.